So glad you've chosen to study with us today. We're talking about how to share the love of Christ. I know for many of us, that's not a very comfortable subject, but we encourage you to stay on and we're gonna explore this and we hope you'll find it very helpful. But first, let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we wanna thank you for this day, the word and the privilege of being able to share our experiences with you, our love of you, and guide and direct our conversation in this day. In your name, amen. Well, as always, before we go into the study, here, take a look at the mission story. Nina does what most dog owners do. She takes her dog out for a walk every day to enjoy the outside air. But things are a little different for Nina. She relies on Fargo to get her out the door and around the neighborhood safely. He's her guide dog, helping Nina navigate the streets. Nina and her husband, Kevin, are both blind, living in a Toronto high-rise apartment building. This Canadian couple lives in many ways, just like anyone else would. They cook, clean, and do household tasks. Nina runs an online business, selling handmade knitted clothing, homemade soaps, and other accessories. Each of these things are an artistic outlet for me. I do the store because I like to have fun with crafts. Nina and Kevin met at Camp Frenda, an Adventist summer camp that opens its doors to the blind community for one week each year. It was sponsored by Christian Record Services at the time. Nina and Kevin's love for Jesus grew, and they both were baptized. During the same time, they fell in love and eventually got married. Despite becoming part of a church family, the reality of their daily challenges still exist. I think a lot of people just don't know how to relate to us, and a lot of people are afraid to even talk to us, and so sometimes they just don't know how to approach us as, as people, and uh, a lot of times we feel left out. In 2007, they were part of the founding team to start a new Adventist congregation with the Ontario Conference. They rented a conference room in a local hotel in Scarborough, a suburb of Toronto, and began meeting once a month. This gathering came to be known as Hope Vision Fellowship and was designed to welcome the blind community. Momentum built over the years, and they formed a core group with new visitors coming through the doors regularly. There's a lot of hopelessness throughout the blind community. I like the name of our church, Hope Vision Fellowship. And that's basically what we are. We hope and we do have a vision. And our vision is to see blind people get saved. And if the blind people come to know Jesus Christ and find healing and hope through his wonderful grace. In 2016, Global Mission helped to support this group. And that same year, Hope Vision Fellowship was recognized as the first Adventist church for the visually impaired in the North American division. Since then, they've started meeting in their own church building, opening the door for more possibilities. Members like Kevin and Nina are actively involved in sharing Jesus' love with the blind community. There are a lot of blind people that really need this hope, and they need, they need this nice time away from their stuff that they deal with every day, and they need sort of a, a slight refuge. And that's my heart, where I want to make people help them feel that way, like they matter. Most of the people who attend are not Adventist, but come because they feel safe here. They come from different religions and socioeconomic backgrounds. This congregation is not just focused on meeting the spiritual needs of its community. They also are aware of the physical needs. Pat, one of the founding members, makes sure that people are well taken care of by creating food care packages for people to take home. As most of them can't afford some of the basic necessities of life, let alone a little bit extra. And some of them have to rely on food banks anyway. So this is one of our 
reaches as well. I mean, this is sometimes the only way of getting their food. Knowing some of the stories of, of some of the ones going to actual food banks, um, they get pushed to the back, they can't see, they don't know what they are. And the one time I was helping a girl um, clean out her cupboard and she had 25 cans of expired spaghetti sauce and no spaghetti. So this is just helping. Thanks to your prayers and contribution to Global Mission, churches like this are planted in new areas and among unreached people groups. I want to thank God from the bottom of my heart for the Adventist Church. It was through the Adventist Church that I found Jesus. It was through the Adventist Church that I experienced His love. And it's through the Adventist Church's help and to the man that I am today. Thank you for supporting Global Mission. It is always grand when we see practical applications, flesh, sinew, muscle, tissue being placed upon the bones that are our faith. I am inspired, I don't know about you, particularly during this time when the question that we are asking is, how do we witness in the Spirit and through the Spirit? In order to answer that question, I think we first have to start by defining a little bit about what we mean when we approach the construct of witness. Let me tell you a story. In 1990, Henry Hill had had enough. You see, for 25 years, he had lived his life with this obsession to become a somebody in a town full of nobodies. Hill had very early on caught on to the criminal element in his town. As such, he saw the inner workings of criminal enterprises. And when he was busted for drug trafficking, he decided to turn state's witness. Now, we wouldn't have known anything about Henry Hill's life or the life of the mafia in the northeastern part of this country, save for the fact that Henry decided to pen a book called Wise Guys. You might have even read the book, or you might have watched that film produced by Martin Scorsese that depicts his story. I don't know much about the film, but I do know that witnessing entails this ability to know the inner workings, to uncover something that was hidden, and to give us some light, light that we would not have otherwise. In order to be a witness, then you need to see something. And today, well, today we talk about what it means to witness in the spirit. Now, a quick linguistic note. The word witness in the New Testament is the same word that our English language can, uses for martyrs. And so the idea of a witness is somebody, at least in the Bible's mind, that has seen Jesus and then takes that message without regard for the consequences. I want you to turn your Bible with me as we delve into our study today to the book of Acts, the second chapter. As we said, in Acts, the primary protagonist isn't Peter or Paul, it is the Spirit. And so today, as we think about witnessing in the Spirit, it seems rather apropos that we go to this particular text in history. Now, the great poet T.S. Eliot once wrote, In my beginning is my end. And Luke here wants to connect us to the very beginning of the community of faith known as the Christian church. Acts is a birth story, much in the same way as Luke, in his gospel, presents the birth story of Jesus. Now, I just want to highlight some similarities. First off, both of these birth narratives are highlighted by the presence of the Spirit. And so as the disciples are waiting to be delivered into a new reality, something happens. They feel these 
tongues of fire upon them. And then Luke rather playfully in the second part of the chapter is going to tell us how these, these same disciples are gifted by the gift of tongue speaking. Oh, that's enough about that. Let me just delve in with you and let's try to chew on the text, shall we? Acts chapter 2 verse 1 simply says that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. I find it astonishing that the idea and the motif that is used to describe the spirit in the book of Acts is the wind. Now, can you think of any force that is more powerful than the wind? Furthermore, can you think of anything that can be left untouched when it comes in contact with the wind? The wind, well, the wind re reaches everywhere. And Luke is trying to tell us that in the same way that this great force of nature can touch everything and everyone, the Spirit of God can do the same. To witness this. To be a participant in the work of the Spirit is to buy in to a revolution of the intimate. And what I mean by that is that the Spirit aids in constructing and depicting the breaking of a community. The breaking of a community where our fantasies of power over people are replaced by God's fantasy of partnership with people. Thus, the Spirit moves us. It moves us to recognize that there is nothing that can stand in the way of the will of God. Now, to speak about this idea, to speak about this language, is to recognize something in language. So I want us to move very quickly to understand what is going on in the first half of this chapter. Now, notice in verse 5 that it says that they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation. And when they heard the sound, namely the sound of the Spirit, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in their own tongue. Huh. Language. To speak about a language is to speak about a people. We said it's a revolution of intimacy, and there is nothing more intimate than our own language. That prosaic poet, the Polish author, Szesla Milos, once writes in his poem, My Native Tongue, that language was my native land. But I believed it was also a messenger, a messenger between me and good people not yet born. And something miraculous happens when we hear our own language. But learning a new language, learning this language of the spirit, the language of the revolution of intimacy, requires some work. It requires enunciation and it demands repetition. But the primary thing that it necessitates is desire. When I was living in the Imperial Valley, my son was born in that place of the country. Now, it's a, it was a border town that I was pastoring where people used to meld and fuse two wonderful languages. Both English and Spanish connected rather effortlessly, which led people to speak both English and Spanish with a rather distinctive accent, an accent that I was never able to pick up. What was shocking, though, is that my son, in this desperate attempt that a toddler has to communicate, was able to mimic the accent. When people would see us and hear us speak, they would wonder. They would wonder because they would think that this baby, my Micah, was actually born in that area of the country. Huh. My son had this desire to communicate. And not only was it a desire to communicate, but it was also a love, a passion for the language, and a love for all that that language conveyed. 
You see, to speak about language is to speak about intimacy, which is why I find it so powerful that the first thing that the Spirit does, my friend, is He allows these God-fearers to hear in their own language. Hearing is the true power and the true miracle. Now, I don't want you to miss this particular point. Because as this is happening, they ask each other a question, and the question can be found in verse 12. It says, amazed and perplexed at the fact that they heard this message of the gospel in their own tongue, they asked, what does this mean? Now pause there for a moment and consider the repercussions of this particular question. Now, these were God-fearers. They were religious people. They were people of faith, people who believed in this story. So why is it that they're asking if there is anything that they need to do? Hadn't their life been committed to the story? The tale about Abraham and the promise of the Messiah? Huh. The only answer that I can give to the question that they are asking in verse 12 is the following. When you come in contact with the Spirit, the Spirit demands that you re reconstruct your theological parameters. In other words, that Holy Spirit, the one that moved upon the waters in Genesis, the one that created the earth, and the one that, sustain, that will sustain the church, it always demands more. You see, witnessing in the Spirit is the outgrowth of the birth of the church. And it is the outgrowth of our understanding that we are now being invited into the breaking in of a community. What does this mean? Well, it means that you now are going to hear this language, these stories, in a new utterance. Namely, the utterance of the Spirit. So it's not only about Abraham or Isaac. It's not about David or the Messianic promise. It's about us. Witnessing in the Spirit, then, begins always by delving in Scripture. But it necessitates that we find ways to weave our stories in with the story of Scripture. In other words, I am Abraham's heir. My friend, when you enter into a conversation that demands witnessing, you must recognize that you are entering into a talk, a chat, if you will, that has been going on for 2,000 years. You have, as your conversation partners, the great heroes of the faith and the disciples. And as such, the task of witnessing demands holy awe. Now, why would any of us engage in this enterprise? Well, the great theologian Karl Barth talks about Christianity as a religion that demands we venture into the far country of love. In other words, it is impossible not to share because this new community, this revolution of intimacy has affected our lives so profoundly that something has changed, something has shifted. Well, after this occurs, after this new language is spoken, after these stories are woven together, Peter will get up and address, address the crowd. And I love the way in which Luke constructs this birth story of the church, because at, on the first part, you have some academic and theoretical principles. But starting with verse 14, you have some very practical principles that, were at, that will answer the question, well, how does this look? namely the task of witnessing in the Spirit in the realm of flesh and blood. Well, verse 14 contains the very first sermon preached in the Christian church. And I want you to notice a few things about the sermon that Peter will deliver. First off, I want you to notice that the sermon is preceded by the appearance of the Spirit. In other words, Every sermon we preach, and by sermon I mean every time we speak about the gospel, we are merely providing commentary on the work of the Spirit. Did you catch that? Our job isn't to create theology. 
It is simply to provide commentary. Because the message that we have heard and the message that the Spirit has spoken is one that is not delivered in the academic language of theological treatises or canonical confessions, but rather, well, it is delivered in the speech of intimacy that promotes new birth. Now, Peter then begins to provide commentary, and in doing so, he recognized this difficult juxtaposition of emotions that all preachers must recognize. And what is that juxtaposition of emotions? Well, that there is an imbalance when we share the gospel, because the message is always going to be more powerful than the messenger. The message must be more important than the messenger. Too often, when it comes to sharing and witnessing, we attempt to share ourselves. We attempt to pass on our understanding of who God is. We attempt to justify our own belief system. We attempt to create carbon copies of what we believe. Which is why I find it rather astonishing that typically when we are attempting to share our belief system with others, we begin with what makes us unique and what makes us different. Let me say without any hesitation that our primary job while we share the gospel isn't to create more Seventh-day Adventists. Rather, it is to create and inspire more followers of Christ. Now, once, that I've, once I've recognized that the message must outweigh the messenger, I must recognize that witnessing, witnessing is not merely the task by which I change people into believers. It is also an invitation to transform myself. And so Peter recognizes that important notion he recognizes that he too must begin to adjust some of his beliefs, some of his preferences, and even some of his practices. For more of that, you simply need to jump and skip forward a few chapters to see just how nimble Peter is when it comes to, be, to transforming himself in order to change people into believers. And the third thing that Peter recognizes and does as he is delivering this message is one that is as important then as it is now. And that is this, my dear friend. When we are sharing a message that far outweighs the messenger, when we subscribe to an invitation to change ourselves and then to change people, and when we participate in this new birth, this revolution of the intimate, we must recognize that we don't stand alone. The preacher never stands alone. You are part of a broad cohort, a cohort of people that have come before you. Think about it. Think about Peter standing there delivering this first Christian sermon. And think about the recognition and what we've just mentioned a few moments ago, namely that the Spirit always demands more. The Spirit seeks to interrupt us and to move us out of these well-established path, established patterns that we've become comfortable with. Think about the 12 or 13 year old Mary as she delivers the beautiful Magnificat. Think about Joseph as he has plans for his life and then has to adjust them to be the stepfather of the Son of God. Think about these disciples as they stood on seashores and in front of tax booths and are called to leave everything behind. God seeks to interrupt us and so we stand in a long list of people who have been interrupted. Mary, Joseph, apostles, Peter, new, new believers and god fears, and then, yes, you and me. The whole purpose, then, of witnessing is allowing 
the spirit to drive that process of interruption. It is, allow, it is to allow the spirit to erupt into your life and to develop new circles of intimacies. In other words, to break into new communities. So Peter preaches, and he preaches a powerful sermon, and then something happens. Something powerful happens. Read with me verse 41. Those who accepted the message were baptized about 3,000 or added to that to their number on that day. Can you picture it? 3,000 people shifting allegiances. 3,000 people deciding to let the Spirit interrupt their lives. 3,000 people who have gathered, who have garnered a closer look at the inner workings of the heart of God. Now, by all numerical accounts, Peter has preached a very successful evangelistic sermon. But what I want you to focus on is the fact that as Peter preaches, as he weaves these stories, as he connects past, present, and future as he allows them to begin to grasp the dream of a new community, he is also conscientious of the fact that the Spirit must drive our practice, that the Spirit must drive our preaching, that the Spirit must move our churches. Now, the question then becomes how does that work practically? Well, in order to do that, I want you to think about what happens in chapter 4. Now, again, in chapter 4, you have these disciples uh, once more huddled together in the upper room. Again, they are preaching and they are pleading and praying for the Spirit to descend upon them. And again, the Spirit makes itself manifest in time and space. And the Bible tells us that the room in which the disciples were began to shake. And I find that word interesting. Often in our church, we talk about the shaking. And we typically relate that with people be, being separated. Those who have the right belief system or who have understood how God operates will be separated from those who are in the church just going and following the motions. But that's not what the Spirit and what the shaking is doing in this particular text. In this particular text, as well as in most of the New Testament, when you find the word shaking, the word that is used in the original language is a word that can be pronounced roughly soleo. And what that word means is that you have a disturbance, an agitation, a shifting, not only physical, but mental and emotional. In other words, what is happening in and through the Spirit is that our lives are being shaken. Our minds are being shaken. Our belief systems are being shaken. Our personalities are being shaken. Our thought processes are being shaken. Our theological treaties are being shaken. Our canonical confessions are being shaken. And they are being shaken because what we are talking about when we are talking about the witnessing of the Spirit is the creation of a new community. I want to end. With, our, with where we began, with our dear friend, Henry Hill. Now, Henry Hill, as he is penning this book, is recognizing something. And what he recognizes at the end of his book, Wise Guy, is that he can never be normal. The book ends with this interesting portrayal of the life of a gangster in the Midwest. No scrumptious Italian food, no chauffeurs, no money to spend. You see, the life that Hill chosen, had chosen, had ruined him and he couldn't return back to normalcy. Here's what happens when you witness in the Spirit. The Spirit will move you 
It will shake you and it will redirect you and it will wreck normalcy. You cannot go back to the country where you live, a country that is a place where it's me first, selfish, driven by desire, propense to looking out for yourself. You cannot live in that country anymore. For the Spirit has caused, called you to, do, to drive out and go into the far country, as, as Bart said, the country of love. And thus you can never be normal again. Peter recognizes this. And it is because of that that he is able to say, I will partake of a new community. And you know what this new community is comprised of. Devotion to teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Those are the building blocks of the community that is birthed out of the revolution of intimacy. And my prayer is that those are the same building blocks that you utilize to build your faith journey. That those are the building blocks that you use when it's your turn to go and witness in the Spirit and through the Spirit. My dear Stu, let's talk about witnessing in the Spirit. That's right. And before we get into it, I hope where we're at, we're still waiting to transition to our new studio space. And so we're hearing a lot of cars and hopefully that's not being disruptive to our those that are viewing. But uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. One of the things that really struck me that I know has impacted me personally, Miguel, is, is, is the re realization that we don't change people. The Holy Spirit is the one that does the changing. You want to kind of elaborate on it again. You mentioned that a lot, and I think this is just a really important point that we make clear. Yeah, I, I am struck by the way, Acts chapter 2, first place uh, in, in these uh, baby steps that the church is taking, you have the appearance of the word church, right? Ecclesia. And Ecclesia, uh, the word itself is a compound word, uh, ek, to me, which means out, and kaleo, which means to called. And so the church is being called out of something. And I think it's being called out of normalcy. And it is being called into a new life of action. Which is why it's so interesting that everything that happens to in these first two chapters in the book of Acts is passive. You have this, these early believers who are doing absolutely nothing. And rather are allowing themselves to be molded by the Spirit. And it is when the Spirit acts that then Peter does something. And as we said in, in our time together here a few moments ago, what we do then is we merely provide commentary on the work of the Spirit. So I think that contrary to what common wisdom would be, when it, as it pertains to a witnessing program that requires a lot of effort, I think what uh, s just struck me as I, as I delved into the texts once again was that in the early church, it required trust and pass passivity. That doesn't mean we always remain passive, but we await to provide commentary on what the Spirit is doing. Well, I think it's, I find it really interesting that I, I think it's important that Sometimes when you talk about effort, often we find that, quote, the effort that we put in is kind of in the wrong space in the sense that we feel a burden. So we, 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 we sense uh, we accept a calling to witness, but then it's so easy to want to like shape and mold a person. I think uh, from the missionary experience, you know, we realized over time that the goal wasn't trying to make them like the particular culture that come in to minister to another. It was for, the, for them to find the gospel within their existing culture. And we realized how that was a much stronger way of approaching it. In this situation, I'm reminded of raising my kids. And I tend to bring them up quite a bit. Um, it, but it just it seems so appropriate. It, it's so hard as a parent, at least I found it hard, 
where you want to just kind of direct your kids the right way. Now, so of course you want to do that, but how you go about that, there, there can be such a temptation to just say, go do this, you know, go do that. And at some points that that's what you need to do, especially at the younger ages. But what the, one of the realities is when you get, when the kid, your kids get older, you're really trying to teach them how to make choices on their own. And that's always, at least for me, is kind of the hard transitional time. I think that's something similar in, in trying to share with other people. We, we kind of almost take this parental dynamic and it is so tempting to kind of try and push them as opposed to when you look at the early church, Sure, it wasn't like it was easy. I mean, people were getting persecuted, executed, or in prison and all that kind of stuff. But the actual witnessing, you know, that it was so much embedded in what God was doing, and they were kind of going along for the ride. You think of all the early stories of what first mentioned, you know, when he preached, you know, they could hear um, in their native tongue. Well, it's not like Peter did this quick, uh, you know, whatever all the different language courses are out there, you know, the night before kind of did a crash course and that was totally out of their control. But what he did do is he shared his personal experience with Christ. And then it was the Holy Spirit that made the change. And I, I don't know, I, I, this is just such an important subject. Now, there's another thing you mentioned, Miguel, that I, I think it's important I give you an opportunity to clarify because I think people will misunderstand it because I, I'm pretty sure I, I, I understand what you're trying to say and I want to clarify that for everyone. And that you said, I think you said something to the effect of we're not really, our objective isn't to go out and make other Seventh-day Adventists. You want to elaborate what you're trying to communicate with that statement? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you asked on that. Uh, so, uh, and and let's let's talk about that a bit i love being a seventh day adventist but my primary identity and name me mind you i am a fourth generation adventist um, but my primary identity for for a couple years now has been i am a christian seventh day adventist and i think that's an important distinction that we need to make we go out and we a lot of the times when we are sharing our beliefs begin with sharing some wonderful truths not there's nothing wrong with our our unique doctrines i love our unique doctrines but i think if we're going to share something we need to begin with jesus and then we need to find ways in which those unique doctrines are linked and clasped in, to Jesus. Obviously, my story is uh, the story of someone in the, within the Seventh-day Adventist faith tradition, and so I'm unabashedly proud about that. But my job right now isn't to create followers of a particular denomination. My job as a pastor is to create followers of Christ. And once we've done that, if we've done it well, then we can invite people to come and see what the breaking uh, open of this community that we love so much that is called Adventism. Well, I think it's really important to understand, and this is something I, I know I've struggled with a little bit because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist because I've chosen to, not because I was born into it. And it, it means a lot to me, and it means a lot to me because I, I believe some of the aspects that, as our denomination has highlighted, has helped me understand more about Christ. Where I think perhaps we've, we've lost it is, and it's so easy to do, and I'm not pointing a finger at someone else, I, I, I'm guilty of the same, where the, the focus has been so much on the facts of a particular belief, they're disconnected with why it's important at all. Because my personal experience, if I've observed different people's stories on how they came into our denomination, it's a wide range. Some of them, it was the Sabbath. Some was the state of it. Some was our prophetic. A lot were under the prophetic kind of in time things. And others were our view of 
hell, like well, uh, we don't believe that people are burning forever, that kind of thing. So it was a, a wide range. And then even when you look at the scriptures, you can see to some extent that there were different contexts. And so ultimately, we're dependent on the Holy Spirit even to guide us in what we start with. Because I'm often reminded, I think many of you are aware of different denominations that come to your door. And is there anything they're going to say that's going to change your mind? In my case, I can't think of a single thing. And we, we need to kind of understand that when we go to someone's door or when we're sharing, there is a need for kind of a humility and a sensitivity. And then not only that, ask the Holy Spirit, what in this context? Because in reality, we have no idea. Now, I, I believe very strongly that we need to be very rooted in our fundamental understanding of that make us Seventh-day Adventists, because I, I do believe it opens up a broader picture in many aspects. But it truly is, and I hope people kind of understand what you're saying, Miguel, because I hope I'm echoing what you're saying, is that, yes, Seventh-day Adventist is important, but let's at least be sensitive. The reality is that even our Seventh-day Adventism, for all the richnesses it is, it's supposed to ha help give us a clearer picture of Christ, not be just a separate kind of side thing that, oh yeah, and Christ is part of this as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you said it, you said it, you said it, Stu. I, I think that'll preach. Um, for me, that, that shift came a few years ago, so I was, uh, and I think I've, we've shared this before, I was a senior pastor of a church that had a rich tradition of evangelism, and it cared deeply about sharing Jesus with others. Um, I began then, because this is what I do, to consume as much material I could about two, two primary things. First off, how were we doing at continuing to allow God to interrupt our lives? In other words, am I willing now as a father of two who is married to a wonderful woman who is now living in a very comfortable uh, city working with wonderful colleagues and pastoring a church that is loving and nurturing am i comfortable or am i still willing to allow the holy spirit to interrupt my life so it was kind of this personal journey that i that i wanted to to embark upon and it was a journey that I also wanted my congregation to embark upon. Now, allowing the Spirit to interrupt your life means that you are constantly growing in your understanding of how the Spirit relates with you. And I found uh, rather, it was rather discouraging. Uh, I found several studies that we had done within our Adventist church that pointed to this baffling reality which was within five years, two thirds of the people that we, have, that we baptize in our Adventist church are no longer active in their local churches. They're, not, they're no longer going to these communities. And so if the church is about this revolution of the intimate, the question then becomes, well, how is it that a year goes by and we don't know that we've lost two-thirds of the people that have just come in. And so then I, I started looking at what keeps people in churches. And I realized that people will go to a church um, where they don't agree doctrinally with what the church is advocating, and they don't particularly like the preacher. But if they feel connected, if they feel this relationship of close connection with the other members, they'll stay. And so that allowed me to recognize something. And the recognition was that we needed to do better at introducing people to the story of Jesus and then finding ways, very much in the same way that Peter does in Acts chapter 2, finding ways in which our Adventist tradition weaves together with this story 
that has been going on before we had we had an Adventist church. Yeah, I I think you know one of the things that of course we talk a lot about as Adventists is a Seventh Day Sabbath, and at present, in kind of the ge more general population, there has been kind of a rise of conversation about Sabbath. Now, it, of course, it means a lot of different things to different people, but it's certainly a connecting point. But again, I. I feel that one of the things that would really help us is we remind ourselves and, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us why that's important at all. That just not another fact or, or we have a better fact or we can pass more of the following Christ test. That it, there is a reason why some of these truths were unveiled and they had relevance. It, it's kind of one of the things that's always bothered me, or I shouldn't say always, but over the last decade or so, it's kind of bothered me a little bit about the doctrine conversation, which I completely get, or at least I think I do, where people essentially say, you know, doctrine, boo, connecting, great, which I know that's, you kind of alluded a little bit to that, but that's not what you were saying. We've so, it's so easy as human beings, we can move it into such a knowledge head-based, it's not connected. And so it's so important that we don't dilute doctrine, but we don't forget that it's so important to connect people because it is actually a relationship with God and we don't effectively relate to people just because we know them in the sense of, I've got these facts about a person. It's much more than facts. Facts are important, they, they contribute, even in our life experiences with relationships, we can go to facts, things we did together, things that happened. There are facts in that, but there's this other dimension to it that needs to be binded with that, that ultimately makes it um, what, what really connects us together. Now we just have a few more minutes. I kind of want to wrap up with just one more, more, more thought, Miguel. And, and that is this kind of going back to your original kind of comments about how we, we need to depend on the Holy Spirit. One of the things that really excites me when I read about the early church, one, it was not nirvana. There's kind of this idea that everyone's saints and everything, you see Peter being having to be taught, Paul, all these different things, things had to happen. Nevertheless, things were happening because not because they were so brilliant, though they had great wisdom, it was because of the Holy Spirit's working. What do you think that whole experience can tell us of what God wants to provide us today? I think it, it tells us and it pushes us to what our true mission would be. Um, I, I, I think I've, I know I've shared with you, Stu, uh, just in our conversations off the air, uh, that when I was in college, I decided to get a job working for an interpreting firm. And so I would, I would do some court interpreting on the side, and then I would do some legal translation on, on the side. And there is a difference between interpreting and translating. Um, interpreting is something that you do typically, uh, at least when it comes to legal interpreting, within a court setting. And so you're doing this thing either simultaneously or consecutively, and a court reporter is taking down what you say, and there is a record, and the record is immutable. It doesn't change. That's what it is. Translating is a little bit different, because when a deposition is given or when uh, a firm hires you to upgrade or to translate their manuals, um, those uh, translations need to continue evolving to stay up uh, and to stay up to date with uh, standard practices. Um, what happens in Acts, Acts 2 is it gives rise to this charismatic movement, right? Uh, the idea of speaking in tongues, and I don't want us to go down that path save to say this. Too often what we think the Spirit is calling us to do is to be interpreters. And what I mean by that is too often we believe that our job is to simply interpret in either consecutively or simultaneously what God is saying in that moment, to write it down and to leave it and store it in a vault 
where it is immutable and then to share it with other people. The truth of the matter is God doesn't need interpreters, God needs translators. God needs people who moved by the Spirit can translate themselves into other people's lives time and time and time and time again. That requires, though, an enormous amount of trust because we need to trust that A, we are listening to the Holy Spirit, and B, that God is going to ultimately lead us. And if you read the stories, too, of the uh, early church, as you've alluded to, it is their ability to translate themselves into the lives and into the context of the people that they're sharing with that allows them to navigate all these crises. It allows them to navigate the Jew and Gentile question. It allows them to navigate the circumcision question. It allows them to navigate uh, the dietary restriction and the food question. It allows them to navigate all these questions because they are understanding of the fact that God is in search for translators. And so if I could say anything, I, I would say this, translate yourself into other people's lives. Have trust that the Spirit will lead, that your job is simply to provide commentary on what the Spirit is doing, and know this, you don't stand alone. You're part of a litany of people who have gone before you. Well, with that, I think we should remind people that also in the early church, sure there was the Peters, the Pauls, the apostles, but the way the church grew was everyone was involved and they shared what they knew. They didn't have to be the great Peter or the great John or the great Paul. They were all involved. And not only did the church grow, but the people within the church grew. Well, we're out of time. Pastor Miguel, will you get, close us in prayer? Sure. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that your spirit break us and that your hands remake us. That you, Lord, speak through us. And that, Lord, we may be used to become, com to become comforters. That as this new community is being broken, and as we witnessing the breaking of a community in order to create something new, Lord, that we may follow with trust and with expectation. Lord, we think about our church, both locally and globally. And we think about how our own communities have been broken due to the difficulty of remaining connected. We pray, Lord, that the Spirit allow this time to be used once again as a revolution for the intimate. That we find ways to connect with each other and that we allow that Spirit that moved upon the waters of the deep, that came and placed a baby into Mary's womb, that descended to earth as you were ascending to heaven, that that spirit come upon us once again and that it might shake us from our malaise and our complacency. For we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you for joining us. I encourage you to join us next week. This is such an important topic, and we just really are so grateful you've, you've been with us today, and we hope you have a wonderful Sabbath day. Mm -hmm.